Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. One of the questions and answers was on 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 30 to 34. But before we get into that, uh, I want to talk about Proverbs 9, 10. Because what it is, is the question was in verse 32 of 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 30 through 34. In verse 32 and 33, they say they fear the Lord. In verse 34, they fear not the Lord. I'm sorry. In verse 32 and 33, they fear the Lord. And then in verse 34, they don't fear the Lord. Okay, we're going to go into this. Okay. But before we get started, I want to kind of get into context of what's going on here when we're reading Kings. Uh, Proverbs 9, 8. Sorry, Proverbs 9, 10. If you can turn to Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. This is the one that someone didn't like what I had to say about it when I said what fearing the Lord was. Okay, fearing the Lord is fearing the Lord. There's no way around it. Okay. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Okay, Because people today will say, fearing the Lord is just knowing the Lord. As long as you know who God is, that's fearing. That's what real fear is. No, it isn't. The devils also believe and tremble. They know God, and then they fear Him. But there's a point where they ain't going to fear Him. Okay, and they're going to try to fight Him. But the point is, is the key word there is wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What does the Bible say? Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. And what do you buy it with? Your time. Over time, God will teach you to fear Him. You'll learn to fear God. So before we get into 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 27, remember, you go through the Old Testament with the Jewish people. They're coming out of Egypt. The first thing there is, is that I think it's very important to understand, brothers and sisters Christ, that the plagues that were done in Egypt, every plague was an attack on a false god, Egyptian god. God was trying to teach the Jewish people, don't fear their lowercase g gods, you're to fear me, capital G God. And if you remember the story, the first few plagues, the Egyptians were able to copy it. But then it got to the point where, we can't do this. This is the finger of God. And we're, I'm getting ahead of myself where they start talking about the most high God. In other words, there's more than one God and there's the most high God. And they're talking about the one true God when they say the, when the heathens, the Gentiles back then would say the most high God. Okay. But you have that first part where God's showing us that there's false gods out there and he is stronger than those false gods. Then Moses, because I just got finished going through the first five books of the Bible, uh, Moses starts talking about how you need to, when the Jewish people came into the promised land, they need to throw out all the heathens. Because if he didn't, they'd become a snare to you. Their lowercase g gods would be a snare to you. And you go through where they're bringing in false gods and start worshiping false gods, and they start to fear false gods, lowercase g gods, above capital G God. Uh, if you ever watched my uh, Christmas study on the Christmas tree, the Old Testament, it's called groves. They were adorning the tree with, with gold and silver, fancy stuff to make it look nice, putting their false gods on top, and they were putting gift offerings underneath. And I always say, what does that sound like? Well, it sounds like the Christmas tree. And what happened was, is because they didn't kick out the, uh, the, he, uh, the Gentiles, the heathen people, they started learning about false gods. And they started adapting those false gods, and they started worshiping those false gods. And they stopped fearing the capital G God. And they started fearing uh, statues of stone and wood and clay. Okay? They can't talk. They can't do nothing. But they were fearing these inanimate objects over fearing God. So this study, when we get through it, I'm going to answer the brother's question, but I also want to drive home the point that People, down through this, since the very beginning, Adam and Eve, over time, it just seems like if God, when it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the fear of the Lord is instilled in us constantly. And we have to be constantly reminded who Jesus is. He's God fully and completely. Okay? We have to be reminded who God is. Creator of all the universe. Creator of all things. Jesus Christ, who is God. Okay? Our lifeline belongs to Him. We have to be reminded to fear God. Right. 
So now turn to 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 27. Okay. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, one part I left out too, is, is the Jewish people got so uh, away from God's laws and worshiping Him and fearing Him only that a punishment was, I think it was 70 years, it could be 70 or 80, but I think it was 70 years, uh, they were going to be in a foreign land. And that's where God allowed Nebuchadnezzar, He said, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant, Mystery Babylon, <laughs> Babylon, the Babylonian system came in and, and uh, conquered Israel and took a lot of the Jews for um, slaves. Okay, And what the Babylonian system did was is they like to add gods. They love gods. They like gods plural. And they like to add more gods to their, their, to their religion. So when they conquered a nation that worshipped certain gods, they would bring those gods in and then they tell you, you have to teach us about these gods so we can add these gods to part of our religion. What happens when you bring all religions together that worship all these false gods? Let's read and see what happens. First, uh, Second Kings, I'm sorry, Second Kings chapter 17, verse 27. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom ye brought from thence. Then he's talking about a Jewish person. A Levite, and let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the Lord, Jesus Christ, who is God the Father. 29. Howbeit every nation made gods of their own, and put them in their houses of the high places, which the Samaritans had made. Okay, now high places, we did a study on this, Brother Says Christ. High places are church buildings. The same thing. The whole point of the high places is they got them from the pagans first and foremost. But you read the story um, when uh, King David, then you had Solomon, then Solomon had sinned greatly, and then his son and God split the kingdom. Of Israel and the two kings, and the second king, in order that was re representing ten, I think it was ten of the nations, because Benjamin kind of clung to the tribe of Judah. Um, bottom line, in order to keep people from going to Jerusalem to work to give their sacrifices and to offer offerings, gift offerings to God, to keep the Jewish people from coming back together, he built high places like the, the pagan Gentiles did. And he built a calf and said, here's where you're supposed to come and worship God. This is where you're supposed to give sacrifice to God. He even appointed priests that weren't Levites. Okay. But that we learned there in that study, that's where high places came from. Okay, they're no different than a church building. You're supposed to worship God at home. You're supposed to worship God everywhere you are. And they'll try to say, yeah, that's what you No, they built buildings, these temples made with hands called church buildings, but we call them Babel buildings, and they say there's where you're supposed to worship. You're supposed to go to church every Sunday. You're supposed to pay to keep a dead building that does nothing for the Lord to keep a building up. Pagan temple. Okay, It's not in scripture. That's why I did that study, high places or church buildings, Babel buildings. Yeah, they're the same thing. They're to try to prevent you from living for God 24-7. You look at the most, the lost people in these Babel buildings. They only live for God once or twice a week. Wednesday night at church, Sunday at church. The rest of the week, they just live like the lost world, look like the lost world, act like the lost world. Why is that? Because they got deceived into high places versus going to the source and living a life of Christ 24-7. But that's where we get the high places. Every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. And the men of Babylon, known as Babylon, Assyria, we're going to talk about this, but the statue where it had the head of gold, uh, the chest of silver, then of bronze, then of uh, iron, and then iron mixed with uh, clay. Okay, all these different people that came after um, Nebuchadnezzar. The Babylonian system gets weaker and weaker. Uh, and less valuable. Okay. And the men of Babylon made Succubinoth, and the men of Cuth made 
Nergal, and the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Avites made Nibaz and Tarkak. It's talking about all these false gods, I think. And the Sepharites burned their children in fire to, yep, false gods, Adramalek. Remember, and if you read Moses, remember one of the biggest things he told Moses warned them and warned the Jewish people when they came in there that they do not cause their children to go through the fire. And one thing I thought was pretty interesting when you actually look into it, what do they do with a lot of this, these, uh, the tissue when they abort babies today? They have to burn them. They cause them to go through the fire. found that very interesting. Adramalek and Amalek the gods of seraphim. So they feared the Lord, here's what was the question, they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places. So they feared the Lord which sacrificed for them the house of the high places. Verse 33, they feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. Now this is past. Okay, because we're going to get to another one that's talking about the present. What's going on here is, is we're going to get in the story of Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to talk about it where it's the most high God. They have all these gods that they fear, but they fear the most high God, but they still worship these false gods. That's what's going on here. Verse 34, but unto the, it's not, I'm not trying to add the but, but I'm saying this is saying this, all this stuff happened, it's past, but now as it gets to the most present day, this is what's going on today. Verse 34, unto this day they do after the former manner. They fear not the Lord. The former manner is before they brought someone in to teach him who the Most High God was. And that they should fear the Most High God. But over time, when you have false gods and you try to intellect all these religions, what happens? Over time, the former manner, they fear not God, or fear not the Lord. Neither do they after the statues, or after their ordinances, or after the law and commandments which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. You can't be friends with false religions. Well, I've got Mormons that are friends. I've got Jehovah's Witnesses that are friends. I've got, you know, Catholics that are friends. You can't. What happens? They will pull you away from the Lord and get you to stop fearing the Lord. They'll get you to compromise. And that's what's going on here. The Babylonian system, regardless what kingdom is set up, remember the statue, we'll go over the statue, but um, bottom line, all these false gods gets to the point where they get them to stop fearing the most high God, the one true God. And he's like, how can it say that? Well, past tense, when the guy brought in, and we're going to tell you the story, because he'll tell the story about Nebuchadnezzar. How did God get Nebuchadnezzar to fear the most high God? We're going to go over those stories. But after Nebuchadnezzar, the silver, gold is more precious than silver. So the next kingdom is, is inferior to his. Why? Because God had to teach um, Nebuchadnezzar to fear the Most High God. And the next guy that came in didn't really fear the Most High God as much. Maybe a little bit, but not as much. Then you had the next people that come in, didn't fear the God that much. Then the next people, to the point where you got the iron and miry clay, they don't fear God at all. The Babylonian system, the Catholic system, they don't fear God at all. They don't follow the, his ordinances or anything. They claim to be Christian, but they're anti-Scripture. Everything their practices and everything they do goes against Scripture. Mm -hmm. well, they feel like they're, they're in the mood to scream today, so I pray the Lord keeps them quiet. But turn to Daniel chapter 2. Let's look at the statue so we can get in the context of what's going on here. The Babylonian system, remember, they like to conquer and conquer. And when they conquer a place, they take that culture and, and basically integrate it. There's the word I'm looking for. They integrate it into their own. So they're adding all these false gods all the time to the Babylonian religion. The Babylonian religion is all about false gods. That's enough! <laughs> it's all about false gods. Turn to Daniel chapter 2. Okay, let's make sure I'm doing it right. Verse 
We're going to read all of chapter 2. Now remember, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream, wherein he th wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep brake from him. Then the, kingdom, then the king commanded to call the magicians, and the astrologers, and the sorcerers, and the Chal Chaldeans, for to show the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show thee the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces. I'm sorry. If ye will not make known unto me the dream, with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut to pieces, and your house shall be made as dung heels. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar was looked at as a, as a lowercase g god. He, he loved to be worshipped. His word was law. It was written down, but his word was law. But if ye show the dream, and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream, and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, Let the king tell us servants the dream, and we will show thee the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that ye would gain the time, because ye see this thing is gone from me. That's how you can tell if people are fakes and frauds. They just tell them what you want to hear, especially those, those people that are prosperity gospels and prosperity, prosperity. You know, tell us your dream. It could be God warning you of something evil and wicked, and they'll make it out like it's all prosperity. He didn't want them lying to him and deceiving him. There's lost people out there that want the truth. They don't want to be lied to or deceived either. But it's hard, it's hard preaching to some of those people because they, when you do preach the truth to them, sometimes they, don't, they still don't want the truth. We'll see what happened to Nebuchadnezzar when he got told the truth of the dream. Did he take heed to the whole dream or did he get fixated on one part? Verse 9. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me, till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things, at, the magi at any magician or astrologers or Chaldeans. It was, must have been a real vivid, I mean, the way he dreamed it must have been really vivid and to the point, I mean, how of us, many of us, brothers and Christ, had dreams where we got into an argument with someone in a dream and you woke up with your heart kind of racing a little bit. And it was one of those dreams that just disturbed you, like, why was I arguing with such and such? Why did this happen? Or if you had a nightmare or something. Because this was something scary to see. It started out like it's a good dream, but then something scary. Okay. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king, except the gods, lowercase g gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause the king was angry and very furious, and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. What ended up showing him the dream? We're going to get to it. Capital G God. Okay, Through a man, a godly man, Daniel. Verse 13, so those guys were just lying, you know. It's funny how that works, where if you use the word of God, you can see right through a lot of these fakes and frauds out there. Just see right through them. God will just show them for who they really are. The truth will come to light. It also reminds me of uh, Simon the Sorcerer, where the truth came to light about him. Verse 13, and the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. I had to scare him away. <laughs> so, okay, sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Verse 14, Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said, in other words, the decree already went out. He was going to kill him. 
He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. I used to, sat there aside, I used to watch that uh, movie, it's called Daniel, the movie or whatever, and it goes through the four kings and whatnot. And the more you read this, the more they added to scripture and made a mess of this. Okay, there was no, you have a certain time decree to do this and everything. No, he was going to kill everybody. And then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the, of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. He was a godly man. Brothers and sisters of Christ, just a side note there, but we also need to, we can tend to forget to fear God, but one of the things we forget to do a lot is to give God glory in everything. The good and the bad. We need to make sure to give God glory in everything. Okay? Whether in word or in deed, do all to the glory of God. Make sure what we're doing glorifies God, and make sure we're giving God glory in everything. When he was shown the dream, he didn't say, okay, good, we're not going to die and just run in there. He blessed God. God showed him the dream. God has the answers. Verse 20. As we're going to find out the Most High God. Uh, to the heathens. To the Jewish people, there's only one God. Capital G God. 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His. Daniel feared God. What is the fear of the Lord? The beginning of wisdom. We read about that. Okay, he feared God. And he prayed to God and said, Lord, help us. We don't want to die with everybody else. And God opened his eyes and gave him the wisdom he needed. Verse 21. And he changed the times and the seasons. And he changed the times and the seasons. He removeth kings. He setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. There's a verse later on that talks about, when the prophecies, I think it's Isaiah, that talks about the lack of knowledge. The Jewish people forgot who God is. The God of their father, fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they forgot who he was. They were going to be destroyed for lack of knowledge. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. Remember we read there again? Buy the truth and sell it not, but also wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Where do we buy that from? With our time. Who gives us that? The Lord. 22. We buy it with our time. God gives it to us over time. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth the what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers. Thou hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desire of thee. For thou hast known, now made known unto us the king's matter. Remember the Bible says, You ask God for wisdom, and he giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not. You ask God for wisdom, and he'll give it to you. Verse 24. Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah, that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. Remember, they all got Greek uh, Gentile names, but they still hold on to their real names when they're with the Jewish people. But his, his new name that the, the Babylonian system gave him was Belteshazzar. Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot be wise men, 
Cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? I like to point this out too. When they came to kill everybody, who was Daniel afraid of? The king? Or did he appeal to the Lord? Because if he was afraid of the king, he would appeal to the king. Please don't kill us. Please don't kill us. Who did he really appeal to? He appealed to God. He asked the king to give him time, but who did he appeal to for his life? Because Nebuchadnezzar is God's servant. My servant Nebuchadnezzar. God's the one who decides who gets killed and who gets who lives. Nobody can come into this house and take me by force unless God gives him permission. Who do we go to to seek help and protection? God. He feared God, not man. Don't don't worry about what's going on out there in the world. Okay, warn people about what's going on out in the world, but don't fear what's going on out there in the world, no matter what country you're in. Fear God. Go to prayer. Talk to God. Ask Him for protection. Ask Him for His will. What does He want for you in these hard times? Because here in America, times are going to get really hard, I believe, come fall. We need to keep praying and fearing the God of heaven. Jesus Christ, the one true God. Jesus Christ, who is God, the Father. There's only one God, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. There's but one capital G God, the Father. You can't get around that verse. So many people try to ignore it and get around it. If Jesus is not God, the Father, he's not God. People forget who Jesus is. Verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. Once again, there's the fear of the Lord there. He doesn't take credit. He gives glory to God. That's part of fear, believe it or not. When you give glory to God, there's fear there. I don't want to take credit that belongs to God. But there is God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and thy vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon the bed what should come to pass hereafter. God was shown in the future. And he that reveals secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. Talking about God who reveals secrets. Remember when Paul was talking about, I show you a mystery? We shall not all be, we all shall be changed in a moment, a twinkle of light. I show you a mystery. There's the mystery of godliness. Where we're allowed to know a little bit more about what the Godhead is, but it's still there's a lot of it that's a mystery. Who reveals mysteries? The Holy Spirit. God. Verse 30, But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. But to their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know that thou know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, O king, sawest, and beholdest a great image. This great image was brightness, was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. That's why it scared him. This image head was of fine gold. I'm going to stop there, just get ahead of myself. It seems like that's all that Nebuchadnezzar remembered, which would hold on to. We'll find this out later. This image head, the image head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, and his feet part iron and part, my, uh, part of clay. Thou saw... Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them in pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth." thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. He's coming back to rule and reign for a thousand years. We've talked about this with our last study. Okay? Filled the whole earth. Verse 36. This is the dream, and we will tell thee the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, our king, art king of kings. Lowercase king of kings. <laughs> Not capital K, king of kings. Lowercase king of kings. Remember, he liked to be worshipped. For the God, capital G, God of heaven, hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what's going on out there? God has allowed it to happen. Why? Because his judgment's coming down on all these nations. 
that have turned against him. I, hope, I don't want to go off on too much of a side note, but they've turned against him. When the King James Bible came out, brothers and sisters of Christ, and uh, ministries started going all over the world to preach the Word of God, to preach the truth. What's going on? All these countries are turning to paganism, sodomy, feminism. Even in the countries I used to talk about, these countries that still, you know, the women wear modest dresses and keepers at home, these old-fashioned, they're like the third world countries, they're old-fashioned. Feminism's out of control everywhere. Feminism is the sin of witchcraft. You got sodomy everywhere. You got these false gods everywhere. They hate Jesus Christ. The Lord, they don't fear the Lord. Uh, I'm sorry. They don't fear the Most High God. Even people who don't know who Jesus is, there was a uh, how do I say it? There was people that went in to witness to certain tribes in different countries, and some of them you could see that they they feared the Most High God. They just didn't know who He was. They were obeying the Ten Commandments. They feared the Lord, but they didn't know who Jesus was. Today, there's nobody on this earth, all these countries, all these, that fear the Most High God. God's allowing it to happen, but God protected Daniel from the wrath of Nebuchadnezzar multiple times. Uh, once, and then it was Meshach and Bendigo. I, I get the three names. We're going to get into that story too, because it's all part of this fearing God. What are they talking about in 2 Kings 17, 27? About they feared God and worshipped lowercase g gods, and then they didn't fear God at all. Mm -hmm. Right now, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't fear God, the Most High God. Remember, he gives them the kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to be who he was and gave him the power that he had. Satan likes to deceive and lie, like when he tried to offer... Jesus, the kingdoms of the earth. Everything belongs to God. He might have dominion right now because Adam and Eve sinned, but everything belongs to God. He'll always try to deceive you into thinking that whatever Satan's doing in the world, God's up there scared, wondering, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? No, God knows exactly what's going on out there. He's moving the pieces himself. He's allowing things to happen. Verse 38, And whosoever the children of men dwell, oh, I'm sorry, and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given unto thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over all of, over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Now I believe the reason why it's inferior is you have the law of thermodynamics. You know things always get worse over time. No kingdom's going to rule forever. I understand people have to talk about that, but what I believe what really made it inferior is as each kingdom goes on, they start to fear the Most High God less and less and less and how they treat the Jewish people. Okay. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things. But remember, iron rusts. And as iron that breaketh all things, all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Talking about the Catholic Church. Mystery Babylon has survived all through these kingdoms to the Catholic Church of today. Catholic Catholicism is Mystery Babylon. Okay, it's Roman Catholicism. It's the old iron of Roman, little part of the iron, and a lot of clay. So that's what today is. Verse 42, And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. People say, well, Catholicism isn't strong in itself. It's partly broken. Okay, they use the kings of the earth to do the fighting for them. I mean, look into it sometime. All the leaders, the world leaders of today, submit themselves to the Pope. Even here in America, they submit themselves to the Pope. Pope, through the Jesuit order, is controlling all the governments. That, they're the ones fighting for them. So the, the Italy, I mean, you look at Rome, it's like they're not strong in itself. They don't have an army and everything like they used to when it was just iron. 
the Iron Legions of Rome. But they still have an army. They just use other people's armies. They use the other kings of the earth. 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the day of the kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It could be the thousand years of Jesus Christ, or you can also argue that this is when he destroys the old heaven and the old earth and creates a new heaven and a new earth, and that's the new kingdom that will live forever. Okay? Never be destroyed. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Okay. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain which, without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass thereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel. Okay, see, he, God's got to put the fear in, in Nebuchadnezzar. He's not worshipping the God. Would it, what did Daniel just say? The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass. And what does he do? He worships Daniel and commands that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. Then the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods. He's starting to get it, but the fear is still not there. And Lord of kings... And revealers of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Okay, and then he promotes Daniel. And what I'm talking about here is what we're going to get into. Turn to chapter 3. Well, we're almost there, it's just right there. But he promotes Daniel. So jump up to chapter 3. What does Nebuchadnezzar do? Does he take heed to the warning of all the whole dream, or does he get fixated on one part? He gets fixated on one part, the head of gold. What does he do? He makes a huge stature of gold and tells everybody that they have to worship it. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in plain of Dora and the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, and the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all rulers of the province were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that the that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. You know what this is also a type of, brother sister Christ? The time of Jacob's trouble, when it talks about he gave life to the image and it came to life. The whole world is going to bow down as a whole. There's going to be some people, the 144,000, that are sealed in their forehead. There's still going to be some people who haven't taken the mark and worshiped the beast, but there's going to be an image. Okay, this is a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. And he got the, all the countries come together, all the people that are in ruler, all the people that are in authority are going to come together. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you is it commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whosoever falleth not down and worship shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Okay. Jump down to Daniel 3.26. Okay. Now you keep reading the whole story. You've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that wouldn't bow down. So they get thrown in the fiery furnace. The, other, the number one reason why I don't watch that, uh, like I said, there's a movie on there that talks about Daniel, the movie, and everything. When it gets to this part in the movie, it says in Scripture that when Nebuchadnezzar looked in there, he said the, third, the fourth one is like the son 
of God. And they took that out and said, it's just an angel. Just, just like an angel. No, it's like the Son of God. It was Jesus that was in that fiery furnace with them, protecting them. Okay. But for sake of time, you read the whole story. Pause the video and read that whole chapter. It's amazing, the story about what happens. They get thrown in there, and they never show this. But when they got thrown in the furnace, it was heated so hot that the people that threw them in got burnt, to a, got burnt up. Okay. And he looks and he tells them to come forward. So Daniel 3.26 this is God once again trying to show him that he's the most high God and trying to get him to fear him. 26, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach. Okay, let's go back to 25 because I said that and I want to read it. Verse 25, He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the firth is like the sun Capital S, Son of God. Like I said, they destroy it. That you got to be careful when you go online. And say, oh, I like this story, or I like that story. I like Ben Hur, or you know the old Ten Commandments. They totally destroy the Word of God. They don't follow the Word of God. They make a mess and a mockery, oftentimes, of the Word of God. Verse twenty-six. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most high God. Finally got him to say it. He's the most high God. Come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. And the princes and governors and captains and the king's counselors being to get, gathered together saw these men upon whom bodies the fire had no power nor was an hair of their head singed neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of the fire had passed on them. Another type of this, when you can look at it, is the two witnesses. Remember we talked about the statue, the two witnesses in the time of Jacob's trouble. They get beheaded, and they get left in the streets for three days, and then everybody sees them, God resurrects them, and then God catches them up. Okay. Death had no dominion over them. Death didn't have dominion over these guys. Fire didn't hurt them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servant and trusted in him, and hath changed the king's word and yields their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. God had to teach him, brother and sister Christ, to fear him. But did Nebuchadnezzar fear God yet? No, he still made a huge mistake. Turn to Daniel chapter 5, verse 21. Okay, it was prophesied, he had another dream, and it was prophesied that if he doesn't keep giving glory to the God Most High, he's going to be run out of the city, and he's going to act like an animal eating the grass. Okay. What's his attitude when he comes back? It's Daniel 5, 21. So remember, this is Nebuchadnezzar. The beginning of, uh, not the beginning of mystery, but Babylon goes back to the Babylonian system, the Tower of Babel. But he's the king that's making all these ordinances that goes down to the next kingdom, because it's all written in law that goes to the next kingdom, whoever takes over, whoever takes over, the next kingdom. That's where we're getting at when you're reading in 2 Kings 17, 27, when it says the king of Assyria commanded, because now Assyria is in charge of Babylon. Mm -hmm. Let's see, Daniel 5, 21. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast, and his dwellings was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointeth over it whomever he will. Okay? He makes it, look at my kingdom, look how great it is, and look how great I am. He puts himself above the God, the Most High God, and he gets punished for it. And he comes back and he, he says, the Most High God is the Most High God. Mm -hmm. 
And thou his son, O Belteshazzar, has not humbled thine heart, though thou knowest, knewest all this, but hast listed up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessel of his house before thee, and thou, and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the God of silver and gold, of brass, of iron, and of wood. Okay, this is the next king. I'm sorry, there is, it's a foretelling of the past, but this is the next king. He takes all the cups, the golden chalices that were the Jewish people that they used for sacrificing to the Lord, and he's drinking it, and he gives offering to gold and everything. What happened? Remember we talked about the next statue, the silver, the this, the that. As it goes down, people are forgetting to fear the Lord. And God has to put the fear back into them. But what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? He got sent out there to come back and he declares that the Most High God is the Most High God. But did he still worship lowercase g gods? Yes. He's a Gentile. He's a pagan. All right. So when you get back to 2 Kings where you're asking what's going on, it's easy to understand because at 34 it says, Unto this day they shall, after, 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 34 says, Unto this day they do after the former manner, they fear not the Lord. They go back to just being pagans before the Babylonian system went in and conquered Israel and brought the Most High God and that religion in to integrate it into their religion, all of the gods. They went back to being the way they were before that ever happened. They don't fear the, God, the Most High God. Okay. Uh, I had a brother in Christ email me and he gave me a good story in the Bible and showing to encourage me when it comes to ministry. As men in ministry, we've got to remember who Jesus is. And we've got to remember the whole point we're doing the work for the Lord. Our work is not in vain. We're going to abound in the work of the Lord and know that your work is not in vain. Okay, you give out a thousand gospel tracts and 999 of them just get ripped up and thrown in your face. But that one that gets read, your work is not in vain. Okay. Uh, Peter Ruckman did one thing, uh, did a teaching talking about men, we need men to do things that are right just because it's right. If you gave out a thousand gospel tracts and all a thousand gospel tracts got ripped up in your face, you don't quit giving out gospel tracts. Okay, you do the right thing no matter what. Okay, we need to be preaching the word of God. But um, he told me about John the Baptist. So turn to John chapter 1 verse 6. Brothers and sisters in Christ, What's happening with this world is they are not fearing the Most High God. Even all these, I mean, you look in the past, people, not, not because they believed in this book, but the Ten Commandments, you know, women wearing modest dresses, being keepers at home, whether they believed in Jesus or not, they had, a, inside them somehow, they had a fear of the Most High God. And that people would obey the Ten Commandments because God's laws are written on every man's heart, and there was some kind of fear there towards the Most High God. Today, that fear is gone. The Bible talks about in the end days where whose, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, their flesh, whose glory is in their shame. They should be ashamed of their sin, and they should be fearing the God most, the Most High God. They should be fearing Jesus Christ. But they don't. Okay. But John, let's look at John, a good example of someone who started to forget because who Jesus was. John 1, chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 6 through 37. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That's Jesus. That's what he's there for. Yep, that's him. Verse 9. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That lighteneth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. We've talked about this before. The sons of God is what we will, be, we will become at the catching away of the body of Christ, fully and completely. We might have it in title, but in deed, 
we're not sons of God yet. Okay, our body has not been redeemed. We already talked about that glorious liberty that the Bible's talking about is not for today. It's when we become the sons of God, we will have that glorious liberty. We'll be freed from the law of sin. Not just the law of sin and death, but the law of sin as well. Sin will have no dominion in our lives whatsoever. Praise the Lord. But He is through Jesus Christ that we get redeemed. You have to go through Jesus Christ. People forget that. Well, I can do things my way. I can do it the world's way. And they stop fearing the Lord. And they forget who Jesus is. Even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Unless you be born again, you shall all likewise perish. It's that simple. People teach against the changed life after salvation, the new creature in Christ Jesus. There are people that don't fear God. Stay away from those people. Verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now the Word was made flesh. I always teach this because the Bible teaches this. This will be another teaching I'll be doing later, going over it again and talking about how the Word was made flesh. It's talking about the likeness of sinful flesh. He came in a corruptible body, that was capable of taking on the sins of the world, yet he himself never sinned, proving that he's God. Verse 15, John bare witness of him, and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all, have all we received in the grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Verse 18, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Jesus is the body. You can see the body. You can't see the soul. So when you look at Jesus Christ, you see God because he's the body of God. You have the Son of God, which means body of the soul, and you have the Spirit of God, which is the Spirit of the soul, the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then, art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Now it's almost a type of a Christian today, brothers and sisters Christ. We're someone, to the lost world, we're just some madman in the wilderness when we preach the true plan of salvation. We preach the real Jesus Christ. Remember, John was put in the world to point people to Jesus Christ. To prepare people for Jesus Christ. Verse 24. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptize thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither the prophet? Remember, Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, you baptize with the Holy Spirit. And they're asking him, Why is he baptizing? John answered and said to them, I baptize with water. It's just water. But there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. See, he's so prepared for Jesus Christ. He's waiting and he's looking, looking for Jesus Christ. Verse 28. And this is also a type of us, brothers and sisters of Christ, when we're looking for the catching away of the body of Christ. We're looking for Jesus Christ. Can we forget to look for Jesus Christ? Can we forget who he is? Yes, we can. Did John forget Jesus Christ? Let's keep reading. These things were done in the Beth, uh, Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Here he is. That's the man I've been waiting for. He's here. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record. We've taught this before in the past. They always say everybody saw the dove, the Holy 
spirit descending like as a dove. No, only John did. Why? Because it was a sign for John to be able to point him out and say, this is him. This is the Christ. This is the Messiah, the son of the living God, the man who's preferred before me. And John bare record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descend and remain on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. He that baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son, capital S, Son of God. Connection. He is God. Further on, it talk, Jesus talks about he, that God is his Father. He's the capital S Son of God. God is His Father, making Himself equal with God. He's God manifest in the flesh. Okay. And the next day after John stood and his two, two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. So you have John coming. He's being prepared for the Messiah, the Christ, God manifests in the flesh to show up, and when he does, he gets to see the sign. That's, that's Jesus. That's the Son of the living God. That's the Christ. That's the Messiah. The man that's going to take away the sins of the world. God manifests in the flesh. Remember there's one meter between God and man, the man Christ Jesus? That's him. He's got all these signs. Remember the Jews require a sign. Well, what happens later? Luke, turn to Luke, chapter 7. Turn back to Luke, sorry. <laughs> Luke, chapter 7. See, when you get saved, you found Jesus Christ. It's like John sitting there. I found Jesus Christ. And you see the change in your life. That manifestation of God in your life, that change, what a change has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Okay? That hold Him. There's a change there. You get excited. There's evidence. And the longer we're here, there's people that sometimes they start to fall away. They stop looking for Jesus Christ to come. They wonder, is He really coming? Do I really need to do the work of the Lord? I mean, I've seen men in ministry where their ministries are dwindling down to almost nothing. Because they've forgotten to keep their eyes on Jesus Christ. They've forgotten who Jesus is. We need to get the work done. We need to get the work done. Luke chapter 7. Starting at verse 12. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city. Behold, there was a dead man carried out. And the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. Now, right now we're going to get there. We're going to talk about how John sent some people to ask him a question. Are you really the Son of God? You know, he's starting to doubt. These people are seeing this. That's why I wanted to start this far back. They're there to see this happen. Let's see what God, does, uh, Jesus, God manifest in the flesh, does. And said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the buyer... And they that bare him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that, and that God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the regions round about. And the disciples of John showed him of all these things. They saw it and they showed him. And John calling unto him two of his disciples sent them to Jesus saying, Art thou he that should come or look we for another? What happened to John? He started doubting. Along with all the other Jewish people. When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in the same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus said, Then Jesus answered, said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, 
the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor, the gospel is preached. Okay. And that's, that's a good thing to look through too, brother. Says, in my life, the blind see. I was blind before I was lost. I was so blind. The blind see. Are people still getting saved today? Absolutely. The blind see. The lame walk. My walk before uh, I got saved was all worldly. I know it's talking about physically lame, but worldly. My walk was all fleshly. I was carnally minded, walking after the flesh. Remember Romans chapter 8. Carnally minded and walking after the flesh. What happened? God healed me and put me on the right path and taught me how to walk. How to truly walk. The lepers are cleansed. Sanctification in the life of a Christian. The deaf hear. The Holy Spirit comes into your life and opens up the Word of God. And my Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that's in, not mine, but God's Holy Spirit that's within me, my conscience can bear witness with your Holy Spirit that God has in you and your conscience. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. The, dead, the old man is dead and buried with Christ. Know ye not that the old man is dead and buried with Christ? Put, you know, put ye on the new man. Okay. The poor, the gospel is preached. We're still preaching the gospel to people who want it. Usually it's the poor that really respond to it. People that are suffering and in, and in poverty, they're the ones that really are in a broken state that can really re receive the gospel. But there, I just did some testimonies, and I'm going to probably be doing another one. There's people still getting saved out there, brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't lose sight of Jesus Christ. Don't forget who He is. Don't forget to fear God. Okay. Verse 23, And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And when the ministers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. We'll stop there. Okay. What, what happened to John? He forgot who Jesus was. He started doubting. Okay. Um, brothers and sisters in Christ, in these last days, I understand he wanted to know why. They feared God, that whole Babylonian system. Like I said, they were, in, they were integrating all these false religions as they conquered places, and they tried to in, they in, uh, integrated the Jewish religion, the Most High God, and God had to teach Nebuchadnezzar to fear the Most High God. And then the next guy, he, he grabbed those goblets and started drinking. If you read the story of Daniel, he didn't last long. Then the next guy came in, and then Daniel was supposed to be, he, the, Daniel in the lion's den. He, he had to be taught that God watched over Daniel to fear the most high God. But each kingdom slowly started fearing God less and less and less. And it got to the point where they didn't fear God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this ecumenical movement that's going on out there in the world, that all religions need to come together and unite, what's that doing? That's causing them to fear God less and Unless there's no fear of God, we show them the scriptures. The scriptures compared to what's going on out in the world. The the Lord God, His Word has the number, their number. He knows what's going on out there, okay? But they don't fear God. And brothers, this Christ, don't let what's going on out there get you to start fearing the world and these false gods over fearing the capital G God. And trusting him that Jesus is who he is, that he's coming back someday, and our looking for him to come back is us living for Christ every day. As we're patiently waiting for that catching away of the body of Christ, we're to be abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what it means to look for Jesus Christ's coming every day. Are we supposed to do that? Yes, you are, with the life that you're living. You're to fear God, you're to give God glory in all things, and you give him thanks in all things. Okay? Psalms 25, 14, we read, you don't have to turn there, but we read, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. Remember what Daniel, he revealed the secrets to Daniel, the mysteries? The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. You know what I find out? A lot of people that start turning their backs on the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, those same people 
they don't fear God. They've turned their back on the, the truth that God has made, the promises, the precious promises, that blessed hope, because they stop fearing God. They start fearing the world. They start getting distracted by the world. Turn to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 15. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what it means to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. And if you fear God, truly fear God, not just knowledge, knowing God, you know, fear God is to know God. No, fearing God is the beginning of wisdom. And fearing God means fearing God. If you're going to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. You're going to do your best to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Okay? And when you fail the Lord, remember what the Bible says, if any man come after me, he must deny himself. You must put down the flesh. When you fail the Lord, deny yourself, repent, forsake, pick up your cross daily. And follow him. In other words, Jesus said, follow me, but to follow Jesus. But this is what it is, verse 13. Looking, no, there's no period there. We're still going on the same, the same train of thought. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. That, that um, what is it, uh, glorious liberty. He's going to redeem us from all iniquity. He's going to redeem us from this body of wicked flesh, this corruptible body that's held in the law of sin and struggles with the law of sin. He's going to redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Brothers and sisters of Christ, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. We need to remember to fear Him, give Him glory in all things, give Him thanks in all things, and trust Him. He knows what He's doing. And keep our eyes on that blessed hope. Once again, when you're keeping your eyes on that blessed hope, what are you doing? You're denying ungodliness and worldly lust, living soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to read 1 through 17. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind. Remember John, he forgot. Remember Nebuchadnezzar, he had to be taught, and he's lost, I understand that, but he had to be taught to fear the Lord and remember who the Most High God was. And that's what's being talked about there. Over time, they go back to being like it was before the Jewish Jews were brought into captivity. They don't even fear the Most High God. But for today, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word. What's going on out there? You look at what's going on out there, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by the letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. One of the ways they're trying, there's different ways, we might do a study someday on the different ways they deceive. And one of the ways they deceive is fear. They try to get you to stop fearing the Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ, who is God the Father, the one true God. They get you to stop fearing him and start fearing lowercase g gods. They start getting you to fear man and fear what's going on in the world. Don't be scared about what's going on in the world. God's got everything under control. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And we're seeing it today. People that aren't standing firm and ain't standing strong. They're not abounding in the work of the Lord to the very end. We see people falling away. Brethren, not just people, brethren falling away. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, 
That's what Nebuchadnezzar did, and God put him, put him in his place. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. And guess what? God's going to put him in his place too. Or that is worshipped so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not, remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things? In other words, he, he said it verbally, and now he's writing it to him in a letter. Remember, when something's repeated more than once, it's important. I mean, once it's important, but it's very important when it's, when it's uh, told us several times. It's been repeated. And, know ye, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. It's the body of Christ. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The end of the time of Jacob's trouble. He opens his mouth, sword comes out, wipes up the 200 million man army. He sets himself up, Jesus Christ, the real capital K king of kings, in Jerusalem, and he sends us, those who get to rule and reign with him, he sends us out to gather the nations. Even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Remember the Antichrist spirit's in the world today. And there's people that are starting to fear this Antichrist spirit. Don't be fearing this Antichrist spirit. Don't get me wrong, the Bible says we're to be sober, we're to be vigilant. For your adversary the devil go around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We're supposed to be sober, we're supposed to be vigilant, but you're not to fear the Antichrist spirit. You're not to fear what's going on in the world. The, so the signs and the lying wonders that people are doing to try to deceive people. We're supposed to fight that fight of preaching the truth. But we're not supposed to have fear. We're supposed to fear God. God knows what He's doing. And with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this, cause, I'm sorry, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God. It's back to us. That's what's going to happen to them. What about us? But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. We give God thanks always and everything. Our eyes and our heart it needs to remain focused on God and His Word. Living a life of Christ, doing the work of the Lord. Don't get distracted by what's going on in this world. Don't get distracted by cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and lusts of other things. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, when to he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. And hold the traditions which we have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Stand fast. Remember what we said this, brother and sister Christ. When Jesus comes back, is he going to find you standing for him in a standing position? Or is he going to find you falling flat on your face? That's something that I talk to the Lord about all the time when it comes to my life as a Christian. And my walk with him. Lord, I want to be standing. I want to be standing for you. I want to be abounding in the work of the Lord. I don't want to be one of those people that's just laying flat on my face, not doing much for the Lord, not, believe, not handing out gospel tracts, not leaving gospel tracts. If you're in ministry, your ministry starts dwindling. I'm not doing much for the Lord in ministries. You're not putting out as many videos as you used to. Or some of the brethren I've, that I believe are saved, they just disappeared. They dropped off. They're not making videos anymore. And I pray for them. And it's like, are you gonna, when Jesus comes back, is he going to find you flat on your face, or is he going to find you going strong, standing firm, and going hardcore with the, uh, doing the works of the Lord, living for Him. Verse 16, Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Good hope, the blessed hope, through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Every good word and work. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the lost world as a whole, they don't fear God. They don't fear the Most High God. They don't fear capital G God. They don't fear Jesus Christ. But they will someday. 
brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I are supposed to fear God, capital G God, nobody else. As far as lowercase g gods, we're not to fear with the world, what's going on in the world. We're to trust the Lord. And the hardest thing to do is to give God glory when bad things are happening. Your health is hurt. Uh, if things get bad and our government starts putting us into quarantine camps, okay, uh, we're to trust God. And we're to fear God. God knows what He's doing. And remember the blessed hope. We're to abound in the work of the Lord until He comes and gets us. We're to live for Jesus Christ, keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ every day, brothers and sisters of Christ. Please, please make sure you're reading this book every day. Morning, when you wake up, start your day with the Word of God. When you go to bed at night, end the day with the Word of God. Make sure you're trying to fellowship with some brethren emails, uh, Skype, um, to encourage one another. Make sure you're staying in Bible studies. Make sure you, get, you buy some or you can make some of your own gospel tracts and you've got them with you to hand out and give to people. Okay, if you're in ministry, get a fire under your feet. Okay, let that, that first love that you had for God's Word in the ministry, let it burn in you and you just get so excited that you just want to start working hard and put out you know, work as hard as you did when you first started in the ministry. You look at your ministry and you see you've kind of died down a little bit. Get back to working as hard as you used to. Bible studies, street witnessing, um, like I said, handing out gospel tracts, fellowship, mentoring, elder men, elder men in the faith, mentoring the younger men in the faith, okay? Um, raising your children in the admonition of the Lord, telling them about Jesus Christ, tell them about the commandments of God. This is why we don't do this, it's because God commands us not to. This is why we, I'm sorry, we do this because God commands us to. We don't do that because God says it's wrong, it's a sin, okay? You raise your children in the admonition of the Lord. You fear God, brothers and sisters of Christ. You fear God. Okay. So hopefully, I know we kind of went around a little bit more on the forgetting who God is, forgetting who Jesus is, and remembering to fear God. But that's what's going on there. Over time, they were taught to fear God. Nebuchadnezzar was taught to fear the, God, the Most High God. And as the next came in, the next kingdom, and they, they start forgetting to fear God. And all they do is they fear their lowercase g gods. And they just go to just worshiping lowercase g gods and not fearing the, the, the Most High God. And brethren, we're to fear God. When you think of sin, get tempted, you start thinking of God and the fear of God. It's a great motivator to keep you from sinning. When you feel like giving up when it comes to doing the work of the Lord, the fear of the Lord and His love and His uh, righteousness, His grace, His mercy, all these things are supposed to motivate us to keep moving for the Lord. But fear is one of those motivators. Right? Uh, we're running a race. We're getting to the end of that race, brothers and sisters in Christ. We're getting there. Don't give up. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.